when people buy a product, they're usually buying an experience. Uh, they're not just getting a widget, they're getting something that they think the widget will make them feel. You know, it will help them with something that will make them feel. If you follow it through, it's also so that I can feel, fill in the blank. So regardless of what you're selling, whether it's an online course, whether it's a you know, product or a service, or you're selling something that ultimately they want to buy because it'll either help them feel better or avoid them feeling like crap. That's it. Pain and pleasure. Welcome to the Viral by Design podcast with Dave Rothero, where we get inside the minds of today's leading viral marketers as they reveal the exact strategies they use to build brands, products, and campaigns that are magnetic to customers, spread like wildfire, and seize the attention of millions. This is Viral by Design. Viral by Design. So welcome to another episode of Viral by Design. I'm extremely excited about today's guest. He is the best-selling author, serial entrepreneur of many years, and multiple te- multiple times TEDx speaker. In fact, I think he may well have done more TEDx talks than anybody else. <laughs> so he was also an experienced trainer for Tony Robbins for many years, and now coaches students all over the world in self-mastery. He's the man who actually got me into personal development way back in 2015 after I attended one of his Sage Business School. So Pete, so good to have you, man. Dave, good to see you, man, and what an amazing journey it's been since that time, hey? Absolutely. No, it's been a, been a pleasure. So, obviously, we've spent a lot of time together. We've spoken a lot about um, self-mastery, about, you know, the kind of the the underlying issues of why people do what they do, and that's something I'd really like to dig in uh, with you today about. So, I guess to kick things off, why, why is it that, you know, in a time when there's so much opportunity in the world, um, obviously, you know, we've we got the, the things that shall not be named that are currently going on throughout this year, but... In terms of there's so much opportunity, being able to set up online businesses, being able to make money, um, et cetera, et cetera. Why is it that people still seem to fail? Why do they hit up against these glass ceilings? Uh, multifaceted question. And again, we let me start out by saying what it isn't, because if we can take a lot of what it isn't off the table and sort of destroy the myths around the stories people tell themselves, uh, at least we'll have a few things on the table we can then discuss. So you know, let's just say it isn't the economy. And everybody's blaming that right now. It's not the global situation. We have got people in 2020 that have absolutely crushed it. And we've got people in 2020 that are absolutely being crushed. And the difference can't be the environment since it's the same environment. It's not just because some people, oh, I'm I'm in the business of selling masks. No, that's it wasn't the fact you happen to be lucky in a product that suddenly spiked. Yeah, there's a few areas there. Like if you're into, you know, if you've got shares in Zoom, then you're happy. But yeah. It's not about that. It's your ability to pivot and take advantage of an ever-changing market, regardless of the situation. And so it isn't the economy. It's not external circumstances. It's what is your relationship to the things that enter your, your world? And we know now, if you go to biology, if an organism sees something as a threat, the organism will naturally weaken. If an organism sees something as a challenge, it will naturally strengthen. And therein on its own lies one of the ways where we see people differentiate themselves from understanding how to tackle what has been for a lot of people a year that they didn't see coming and they don't want to remember. And for others, it was the chance to shine. It was a chance to step up. It was a chance to prove themselves, the chance to get resourceful. It was like, okay, now this is real. This ain't a dress rehearsal. I've lost my job. I've been downsized. I'm on furlough. I'm like, whatever it may be, what do I do now? And it's at that tipping point. Do I say, do I see this as a threat to my lifestyle, to my income, to my way of life? Or do I see it as a challenge and therefore an opportunity? Because humanity historically over the last 5,000 years has experienced every single year two things. And they're going to experience the same two things in the next 5,000 years, challenge and opportunity. And so it's not about, I want smooth sailing. It's about how do I react to the current of the river? And that kind of really sets the people apart. And I'm yeah, looking at you, for example, you've probably had one of your best years having known you uh, in business in 2020. Why? Because you saw it as an opportunity, not as a, as, as a threat. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, I think that even in and of itself, like, um, is a challenge to hear, right? And that's something which I've kind of battled with it myself 
is the idea of how do you realign like what's going on when you inevitably do come up against the crap in life how do you realign that in a positive way that you can actually use to propel yourself forward and, and in reinforce what you're doing rather than getting into like a, a downward spiral because you know it's very apparent that you can either be in an upward spiral the rich get richer the poor get poorer you know you can either be in in an upward spiral you can you can be in a downward spiral so what would be your like direct advice for somebody if they were suffering from this kind of thing right now? What would be, say, for example, a great one, actually, what would be a good thing that they could do and a good goal that they could set, which would be achievable and attainable and they could legitimately hold themselves to in 2021? Where, where should they start? Right. So you can't sort of set specific goals for different people because you know, everybody's situation is different in the external world. So once you understand that the external world follows the internal world, you can back up a little bit and say, hang on a minute, how do we yeah, arm ourselves for being able to be best positioned to take advantage and set goals with the belief system that I'm going to hit them, not the hope that I might, uh, or the, uh, the resignation to the fact that I don't think I can, so I won't even bother. And if we back up the three words that I want yourself and your audience to tattoo on the inside of our eyelids is this context is definitive because so many people are out there trying to change content they're trying to try a new job or set a goal to lose weight or whatever context is everything and especially in this environment i'll demonstrate so if you see yourself yeah in life and there is a a, a tough workout in the gym now if you don't know that you're an athlete and you get put in the gym, you're gonna start resenting that personal trainer bloke who's forcing you to do press-ups until you can't breathe and you know, or run on the treadmill until you throw up or, you know. And so you're gonna either hide behind the weight stack when you see them, or you know, you're gonna get cornered and end up just doing enough weight on the bar to tick the box to say you've done the workout. You're gonna have a resistant level of relationship to the workout because you don't know you're an athlete. You don't know why you're in the gym. You don't like it. It's like, I didn't ask for it. You know, I didn't ask to lose my job, but you get the point. Now, if you start to understand that life is not a comfort-centric experience, if you think that, A, you're in Disneyland, B, you're going to get some pretty serious feedback from life that'll say you're on the wrong track. That's like saying, oh, I know I can lose weight by eating carbs. Right? It's, you're going to get some feedback that says that just isn't going to work. So instead, if you start to know, if you walk in knowing that you're an athlete, that you're here for the gold medal because you understand the fundamental difference between life being a comfort-centric experience, illusion, versus the authentic truth that life is a growth-centric experience. So you walk in because you're an athlete and you're here for that gold Olympic medal. Guess what? Same push-up, same treadmill. But now if you're not throwing up in 30 minutes, you want your money back. And so being able to have the relationship to the outer world from a place of understanding that, hang on a minute, there is no certainty in life. Let's start there. Case closed. Let's put it on the table. Some point, you're going to die. All right, let's not beat around the bush. At some point, the relationship you have with your body will end, let alone every other relationship. So what does that mean? That means that if I'm here trying to snuggle myself into some bubble wrap protected experience called life, I'm going to face what other people would call shit. I'm going to get stuff thrown in my way. I'm going to have the personal trainer kick my ass. Why? That's his job. Instead of turning around saying, you know something? I'm an athlete. I'm here to train. Yeah, life is a growth-centric experience. And how do you grow? Well, let's go back to the gym. You grow by challenging the muscles past their comfort zone, past what they think they're capable of. And at that point, they send a message to the brain saying, hey, we're getting beaten up down here. You better rebuild me stronger. And you can't even stop that from happening. It's part of the rule set. But if you're taking the perspective of the muscle fiber, it's comfort centric. It's like, whoa, hang on, what's going on? I'm being broken down. That's too much weight. I can't lift that. Quick, send a pain message to the brain. Tell them to stop. What the hell's going on? And so many people in today's society, when it comes to taking the risk of starting their own business, when it comes to making decisions that may not you know, have everybody agree with them, they're looking at it from the perspective of the muscle fiber instead of chunking up and looking at it from the perspective of the athlete that's ignoring the pain signals, that knows that, you know, I'm, I want to bust out that last burning rep that can get a personal best and feel proud that I can't lift my arms for the next two hours. Hmm. And so it's about getting the mindset right. You can learn all of the skills, the marketing, the strategy, the sales techniques, all of that stuff. 
But if you don't walk in with the mindset of the athlete saying, you know something? Huh. <laughs> there is no certainty in life. Entrepreneurs are trained to handle uncertainty. Wow, we've got an uncertain year that's just happened. Boom, what an opportunity for me to step up and actually do what it is that I'm trained for, to do what I'm here that I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm here for. And guess what? If you swing the bat and fail now, you've got an even better excuse because most everybody else is. <laughs> right? I mean, it's, it's the best time in history to start a business. Not only have, yeah, uh, have you got the, the tide against you in terms of sentiments, right? but if you succeed now, which is so easy when you understand the mindset shift, Right, living in a time in history where people are desperate and people will always do more to avoid pain than they will gain pleasure, then you've got a golden opportunity if you start looking for it. And that's yeah, that's the first bit of advice. It's like check your thinking. What are you looking to do? Stop focusing on what you think you want to do because you're looking at path of least resistance. Start asking yourself, what value can I add right now that would solve people's pain? What are people looking for right now? And you'll start spotting opportunities left, right, and center. And then you couple that with the fact that you can live in a time in history where you don't need to invest a million pounds in some capital infrastructure, big lease on an office for 20 years, and you know, trying to drive traffic through print media. That was the world I lived in for two decades before social and online stuff came out. Now, any kid in India with a smartphone can run an international business. And all of that stuff I used to spend a million quid with for an infrastructure, you can get the benefit of 20 million quid plus a billion dollar company now that's put everything in and you can use the best of all of that for $6.99 a month on an app. Yeah. Give me a break. And you yeah. want to start your business uh, at some other time when it's more convenient? It's never going to happen. It almost feels sometimes like it's so, because obviously there's, there's the thing of inf information overwhelm, right? There's so much information out there that people just don't know where to get started. But I, I kind of feel like there's so much information out there and there's so much opportunity that it almost feels too good to be true. And I know one of the things which, you know, you really told me was the concept of, uh, you know, human beings having this unwavering need to define themselves um, or to live in, in, in the essence of how they, their, their subconscious mind defines themselves, you know, not being able to break out of that, of that casing of how they currently are. And, you know, their subconscious mind putting them off all of these opportunities that, that are in front of them just to, to remain true to that self-image, right? If you see yourself as an employee and you lose your job, you're going to apply for another job. Why? Because you're an employee. If you see yourself as an entrepreneur, and like, Dave, you and I are what I would call unemployable. Yeah, I'd agree with that. <laughs> right? If we lost our business tomorrow, we're not going to go get a job. Why? We're not employees or entrepreneurs. Now, we probably have a lower IQ than some very qualified employees. We probably have less resources in the bank. If you go through a business failure, probably minus you know, a few hundred grand or a million more than most employees have yeah, in terms of uh, additional debt. But we're still not going to go get a job because it's not who we are. So my question to people that are struggling right now is, how do you see yourself? Some people are quite happy being a victim, which means that they're going to engineer circumstances in the outer world that will support their ability to be a victim so that they can get around having to own the courage and face fear of failure. So they'd much rather have a victim, which it's a crappy life. You, but your brain doesn't tell you that when you're looking to step out of it. You know? Or you say, I was a born entrepreneur and I may be working for somebody else right now, but I'm an undercover entrepreneur. I'm trying to suck all the information out of this business so that well, I can get paid while I'm thinking on the job as to how my next enterprise and my first ship I'm going to sail as captain on is going to go. So identity is everything. Yeah, you're absolutely bang on. Why do vegetarians not eat meat? Because they're vegetarians. Right? It's not because they have a different blood type or teeth you know, formation or digestive system or what have you. Again, you, you, your values will determine your, why you want to choose being a vegetarian, but once that decision is made, I know exactly what you're not ordering off the menu. And it's not because you're not capable, it's because your identity will prevent it. So what identity do people have that prevent them from taking on opportunities, from looking for opportunities, from even spotting it? Now, is that part of the brain, the reticular activating system that is programmed to notice what's important? Now, what's important? What you tell it is important. Yeah, that's why at a party you could be in a conversation with someone and three conversations the other side of the room, somebody's having, and your name is mentioned and you hear it. It's like, oh, hang on. Someone's, what was that? Someone mentioned my name. Right? Because all of the information is coming in. 
but the reticular activating system acts as the bouncer of the party. Yeah, there's a whole load of lineup of people. And if your name's down, you get walks in. If your name's not down, it lifts it up the carpet and you get swept under the conscious awareness into the subconscious and it never makes it into the party of conscious awareness. Now, there's one other aspect. Now, again, another, another example. Let's say you, you know, we all know you buy a car and then you see that car everywhere on the street. Well, guess what? They didn't have a sale on that week. Everyone's just buying those cars. Your reticular animating system has now been told that that is more relevant than it was before you bought the car because it's now a connection to you. So it comes above the carpet. The bouncer takes off the little rope lanyard, ticks off your name, and you walk into the conscious party. Now, there's one other thing that gets access that trumps the reticular activating system. There's one thing that the bouncer doesn't have any jurisdiction over because it comes in at a high level, and that's security. Security can walk anybody into the party. And the security is the part of the brain called the amygdala. And what it does is designed to notice a threat to survival or security. Evolved tens of thousands of years ago when if we put, walk past an apple tree, if we are not hungry, then guess what? The apple's not on the clipboard for the bouncer. Not important, not relevant. If we're hungry, guess what? Eyes notice the apple. Why? It's on the clipboard. We've told the bouncer it's relevant to us. But if we miss a snake, whether we're hungry or not, that could be a big deal. So security is always looking around as well. And if there's any threat to surviving security, it will walk it past the bouncer, regardless of the clipboard, and walk it into your conscious awareness because it's a threat to your survival or security. That's how the media's uh, modus operandi works. They can't get access to you in your life by knowing what's important on your clipboard. So they use security. They use a, an amygdala trigger, fear, sensationalism, drama. Oh my God, shock value. Because the amygdala is like, oh, what's that? Quick, let's get it into you, but let's get it into the party. Just walk straight past. Don't worry about the bouncer. All right, trump card. So when you start tying in your identity with the amygdala and the bouncer, you start having a shift. Why? Because if your identity is entrepreneur, what's on your clipboard? Opportunity. If you're an employee, it's not. Job application, interview, vacancies, that's on your clipboard. That's what you're going to notice in the outside world. If your identity is somebody who's fearless, who is an opportunity magnet, who can handle anything life throws at you, you're going to get far less amygdalas, security guards marching into your conscious awareness. You hear something on the news where someone says, oh my God, it's a big disaster going on. And you're like, yeah, I fucking handle that in my sleep. It doesn't trigger. Get my point? Yeah. Yeah, that's huge. And, you know, that's something I remember from, there was so many things from that Sage Business School that I attended in 2015. And I remember a couple of years later, I attended again. And um, uh, suddenly, you know, a lot of the stuff that you're saying was coming up. It's like, ah, that, there's something I implemented in my life. And I completely forgot that I got it from Peace. <laughs> But that was that was one of the huge things actually was um was was not watching the news because that's something which is drilled into you uh, from all angles right and when I first heard you say that I was like well, you can't possibly not watch the news you need to be aware you need to know what's going on in the world but then you know you made the case like, okay I'm, I'm gonna give this a shot and you know I stopped I stopped watching the news and it's it's huge because it's exhausting right every single day being bombarded with this information let alone the you know the like hundreds of thousands, if not millions of marks and messages that we're, we're exposed to on, on, a, on a daily basis. But it's exhausting. It's, it's completely draining. And one thing that I've noticed certainly this year, because it's all too tempting just to check in and see, okay, what's the likelihood that we might be able to go outside again within the next few days? So, you know, you start going to bbc.co.uk and maybe flicking around a, a few of the news articles and then you get sucked back into it again. It's, they're masters at it. They're absolute masters at it. You know, okay. And again, if, if you believe that anything on the news has any version of reality, you're in Disneyland. And then there's a reason they call it programs. Yeah, <laughs> that's so true. You know, they're just programming the crap out of people into a fear-based state. It's the only way they can get clickbait. It's the only way they can get eyes on. It's the only way they can justify rate card for advertising. It's the only way that they can control yeah, the minds of the public by the, controlling the narrative. And as a quick side, you know, throughout human history, we've known that the global elites and the secret societies, which make no secret about the fact they exist, they just make it secret what they teach inside there. But you know, we've known throughout human history that you know one to three percent of people in the world own the world or control the world. 
And if you should control it through controlling five different aspects of society, if you can control the money supply, central banks, Fed Reserve, yeah, if you can control yeah, healthcare, right, which is the biggest misnomer because it's not healthcare, it's disease management. If you can control the food supply, I mean, you can't plant seeds in America now as a farmer unless you buy them from Monsanto, yeah, GM deal, right? If you control the oil, right, you control transportation. All of those four are great. If you control the fifth one, you control everything. As if you control the media, you can control the minds of the public that are, yeah, bought in enough to, yeah, turn it on and, and tune in. And I said right from day one, and I'm not going to drill down on the subject here because I said that shall, will not be named, but if anyone thinks what's going on is actually what they're being told that's going on, then let me just tell you, yeah, this isn't a blank demic. It's an IQ test. And... There's a lot of people not passing it. And the reason they're not passing it is because they've been fed and programmed by programs that they don't have the ability to turn off. So, yeah, that's my, my whole thing. Protect the amygdala. If you do not take control over the information you get inside, you are at the mercy of other people who have a different agenda to do so. 100%, yeah. And there's, I mean, there's obviously a lot of smoke and mirrors going on. And there's something, you know, there's, you could drill and talk about that kind of stuff for hours. One thing I'd really like to talk to you about um, is, because obviously you've had a, a massive sort of past and, and uh, all sorts of different experiences uh, as an entrepreneur, whether it be brick and mortar, whether it be online and, and everything else. One of the huge things um, which you spoke about, again, about Sage Business School, and we, we chatted about since, is how to create a really incredible customer service experience and being customer centric. I think this is something, you know, especially in terms of, say, for example, uh, with stuff like drop shipping really becoming more apparent and so many people flooding into the marketplace and quality being crap and customer service being being terrible. One of the ways that people can really set themselves aside as businesses is by having this really fantastic customer service experience. So do you mind just spending a few minutes talking to that, like how you did that with your businesses with, um, was it was it World Health? No, it wasn't the World Health Organization, was it? What? <laughs> the World, World Hoax Organization. Okay, so uh, it was uh, the World Wide Health Corporation. That's the one. Uh, this was a, a top nutraceutical company I founded in 97 and sold it in 2005. And um, it, it all comes back to a lot of my history where, you know, I, was, I dropped out of school at 16. I started my first business at 17 with my last 20 pounds. Uh, I've never had in my early days the ability to invest in the business, you know, in my own business. I had to figure it out. So I couldn't compete at the level of business where a lot of the big boys were at in terms of finance. You know, your Holland and Barrett, your GMCs, I couldn't compete with those guys, not on price. But I learned that I would never, ever have to compete. In fact, if you're competing on price, you're a fool. And that's what Amazon is these days. Amazon is a race to zero margin. You know, pretty much. And so instead, I learned how to compete on the one thing that most people want. It's what most people spend their entire life looking for, even if they do not not consciously aware of it, and that is to feel good. And that could be, doesn't necessarily have to be happy. That could be fulfilled. It could be grateful. It could be yeah, um, uh, satiated. It could be whatever it, the, the feeling is. They want to feel good. And so when people buy a product, they're usually buying an experience. Uh, they're not just getting a widget, they're getting something that they think the widget will make them feel. You know, it will help them with something that will make them feel. If you follow it through, it's also so that I can feel, fill in the blank. So regardless of what you're selling, whether it's an online course, whether it's a you know, product or a service, or you're selling something that ultimately they want to buy because it'll either help them feel better or avoid them feeling like crap. That's it, pain and pleasure. So if you start recognizing that, why do people need to buy my product in order to feel good? Why not feel good buying my product? Surely that would lead to a, a more successful uh, sale rate. So the entire customer journey, the customer experience, and, and how you position yourself, people these days can smell if you're yeah, clickbait BS or you know trying to, uh, just rank up numbers by giving low quality crap or you know, marketing hype and all that kind of stuff. We're in the market now for authenticity. We're in the market where people who are authentic and vulnerable. Yeah, what are the what are the posts from the, the stars that get the most? They're not the razzmatazz three camera green screen kind of look at me on a yacht sipping martini. 
They're the ones where they take the makeup off and, and share their vulnerabilities and like say, you know, hey, crap, I'm, I feel just like you on days like today because, you know, blah, blah, blah. And people relate to that. There's an honesty about it. And if you can put that across in your experience where you can feel the customer's feelings and you can step in their shoes, you can engineer an experience that will make them go, wow, I feel heard, I feel felt, I feel important. And, you know, with these people, if, if you feel felt, heard, and important, by the way, you usually feel great because so many other people are waiting to talk rather than actually empathetic listening. And so those three things alone on customer service, you master the ability to listen and hold a space for your customers. You know, Dave, as you know, I've been on, I don't know how many podcasts, a couple of hundred uh, uh, over the last few years. And there's a huge difference. Yeah, you and I definitely got a great relationship. I'm I, I, adored the time we've spent together and the value you've added to my businesses as well in so many different ways. And there's a huge difference between an interviewer who has a list of questions, which I'm glad you said when you said you don't have any questions, let's just go and see what value we add. It's brilliant. They have a list of questions and they ask me a question. And I probably spend five, 10 minutes drilling down and, and really finding and uncovering some gold and really taking the time to try to frame it in a way that the audience can understand and practically apply. And as soon as I finish this, yeah, what I consider to be a, a huge mic drop kind of wisdom level moment before the word, the last syllable has stopped echoing off the walls, like, oh, my next question is, there's no connection to what I'm saying. And I feel, hey, I just handed you something that could change your life. And you don't even want to ask questions, drill down, take a moment, look at it, because they're stuck in the head waiting to ask the next question. And yeah, there's, there's very few people that I've ever been interviewed with that have that level of skill. And one, I'll, I'll give him a shout out, Brian Rose. Brian Rose is a great interviewer. Now, yeah, we, we disagree on a few other things, but he's, he's a great interviewer when it comes to being able to hold a space for you know, being with somebody and asking those questions. So you know, if you can, in the customer service experience, if you can make, if you imagine you're interviewing your customers, are you waiting to ask the next question are you really interested in what it is they're saying so they can feel you know, felt, heard, and valued and important and connected? So if you can do that, which costs, by the way, well, let me just uh, figure out what if I subtract the net value? Nothing, right? Yeah. Costs nothing. And even if you do invest a little bit, you now like one of my girls that was listening to, to one of the customers order a product uh, for Worldwide Health back in the day, and she uh, the, the customer was coughing on the phone and they were chatting away. She just ordered some tablets. Anyway, the girl, Jenny, her name was, her lunch break, she walks down to the uh, local shop. She gets herself a, a little sandwich and stuff for Cobb. She walks next door to the pharmacy. She buys a little packet of Hall's Mentholipsis throat sweets. She gets a little jiffy bag. She writes it out to the customer. She puts a stamp on it and a little handwritten note saying, oh, hi, Mrs. So-and-so. Couldn't help notice you were coughing a lot on the phone. When I get a cough, I take these and they really help. Hope they might do for you too. Now, put yourself in the mind of the customer next morning that's ordered some tablets, you know, 30 bucks of the tablets that are going to arrive from America in the next four days. And what drops on your doorstep? Little bag, handwritten envelope, jiffy bag, you open it up, and you read that note. Just put yourself in that mind for a second. Just play with that level of emotion. When was the last time you bent down at the mailbox, Dave, and picked up a pack of throat sweets because somebody heard you coughing on the phone? Two. Probably never. Now, what did that exorbitant marketing exercise cost? A, it wasn't a marketing exercise. It was authentic. It's how she showed up. It's why we train our staff to hunt for opportunities to impress. But the total thing, my contribution to that, I wasn't even aware of it. It was a company stamp I was happy to give. Yeah, and a jiffy bag from the post room, which I was happy to give. Jen even paid the one pound for the throat sweets out of her own pocket. you got a customer for life? you damn right. You get a leaflet on the door or an email through the uh, in your inbox next day from a competitor offering a 20% discount you know, for some cheaper version of what you buy from us. Are you going to them? Are you kidding me? Never in a million years. I was never competing on price. I was never competing on in my health clubs. If we could have a bigger jacuzzi than David Lloyd or Next Gen or Fitness First, I can't compete at that. They're a multi-zillion dollar company. Yeah, we're trying to work off small margins and empower people but we can impress the hell out of them, which is why we won the Flame Awards of the industry the first year we were in business, like the Oscars of the health industry. And, and the company, by the way, just got sold for you know, shy of 20-odd million dollars. 
uh, pound, sorry, you know, a few months back. So um, the actual piece of that, I remember that you tell that story about the throat sweets, and I actually put this into, into play in one of my businesses at the time. So we had a, a grilled cheese sandwich subscription business, which was a hell of a lot of fun. But um, so there was a, a customer who unsubscribed, and I was going through at the time looking at all the unsubscribe reasons to see how we could kind of fix it, if there's anything we could address to people can all subscribe. And I saw that this guy had found out that he was lactose intolerant. So just as a bit of a joke, sent him a, um, our deepest condolences card in the post. So we're very sorry to hear about your loss of the ability to eat cheese. And it was, you know, a bit of a joke. The thing ended up going viral. The guy posted a, a video on YouTube of this card with like dramatic music behind it. It went viral. And we calculated on, on the clicks that came back. We got about 150 million customers off the back of it just through a bit of a joke. And like, as you say, something which costs absolutely nothing at all. So massive strategy. You know, if people only take that one thing away from this podcast episode, it's huge, right? Yeah, it just takes a little bit of thought. And in an area where everybody's trying to compete for, you know, Google AdWord ranking and SEO and Facebook ads and everything else, people are forgetting the real, you know, what we call human to human touch yeah. rather than the sort of business to consumer touch. Yeah. And, that, and that's where you can clean up. Yeah, I, I, I outsold and outmarketed and sold more expensive products to more people than GNC and Holland and Barrett with Worldwide Health. Our customers would step in front of traffic uh, rather than you know, buy a cheaper product from them. Uh, our health clubs were synonymous for inspiring people to become better versions of themselves, not just provide a place where they could train. And yeah. it didn't take any more. We, we had less equipment, you know, less modern, couldn't afford it. Yeah, we had... Yeah, as I say, more expensive products because we didn't have the ability to buy in bulk for worldwide health. Yeah. But we had loyalty that you couldn't purchase or put a price on. Yeah. And you know, in in a in a time when so my my agency is a performance arts agency, right? So we're entirely focused on metrics and um exactly how much it costs to get somebody to click through, the performance of ads, yada yada yada. But still, you know, it's if people understand, people are really metric focused, understand, like take a step back and take a look at the bigger picture of what those kind of interactions and what that kind of brand reputation can do for the ads and the impact that it'll have on the ads in terms of supporting the, the, the performance there, it's huge. It's absolutely massive. It's, it's, it literally is immeasurable because you can't actually see it in the metrics, but it's, it's absolutely without a doubt that that kind of, not only if you were to actually really try and put a, a boundary around it and use it in a measurable way, those kind of interactions, the video that we got from that guy, um, and you know the, the interactions that you actually do have on social media with these customers, you can then run those things as ads as well. You know, so as much as they, they start out as a as a, a completely organic and as you say not marketing uh, endeavor, they can actually turn into one once you get that, that real brand reputation on the roll. Oh, you keep putting it out, it's going to come back. It may not come back directly because life's a non-linear experience, but yeah, it'll meet you where you're at. At a level of consciousness, a level of contribution. Yeah, you may you may not have got that back that video back from that particular guy, but the, the kind of attitude that you have on serving your customers at that level, it would come back from somewhere. It has to balance. And yeah, you you, you need to watch your margin when we're in business. You've got to, you know, metrics are critical. They're gonna tell you if you're on track or not in terms of the quality of service you provide, in terms of you know, the the thing that people are paying for, but it's the intangible stuff. Uh, the, the stuff that they're not paying for that they get uh, that they feel is what's going to take you head and shoulders above the competition absolutely 100 percent. hey what's your what was your most exciting experience as an entrepreneur you've done so much different stuff what would you say was that the most exciting thing you've done oh wow um probably going for my penthouse in canada right yeah i remember you showed me pictures of that place yeah yeah it was um uh, i just had a correction i i got virtually nothing in the bank uh, and I was just looking for a a poster for my vision board, you know, a picture for my bathroom mirror. And yeah, you know, I would I Googled luxury penthouse Vancouver. This building came up. I'm like, oh my God, that's mine. They just built that for me. They didn't realize. And I didn't even know how much it was. I it was midnight in England. It was eight o'clock in the sorry, four o'clock in the afternoon in, in Vancouver. And I just picked up the phone, spoke to the real estate agent. I was like, I'm, I'm interested. Uh, anyway, I didn't didn't realize it was five million dollars. And I said, what has to happen to make it mine? And I'm thinking, I've, I've got virtually nothing. And it was about to be sold. And I'm like, whoa, 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 we can't sell it. He says, but the fourth, there's five stories. And the, you know, the fifth floor penthouse had the roof deck. And he says, fifth floor sold anyway. He says, you have the fourth floor. I says, I want the fourth floor. I want the penthouse. That's my vision. He says, well, the fourth floor is really, really nice. I'm like, listen, I'll take the fourth floor if you take the fifth floor off. Right? 
And, uh, and he starts laughing. He says, can't do that. He says, look, we're going to close on this in a couple of weeks. I says, oh, so it's not sold yet, the fifth floor. I says, yeah, what has to happen to make it mine? He says, well, listen, if you're serious, we need a 10% deposit wide in the next 24 hours, non-refundable. That's 500000 half a million dollars. And he says, we need the balance to close within six weeks, otherwise you lose your half million. Now, I wasn't a resident of Canada, so I had no tax records there. So in order to put half of that, to get a $5 million mortgage, I have to go what's called non-status. This is before the 2008 collapse, it's 2005. And so I need a 35% deposit. So I put the 10% down, I still need a 25% deposit, which is a million dollars. So I've got to find, and I, I worked out, if I remortgaged, if I yeah, loan shark, if I borrowed 50 grand from my mom, maxed out my credit cards, drained every account I had, I could probably scrape the half million together. But then I'd have six weeks to find and well, earn, so I couldn't borrow it on top of the borrowing. The bank would need to see it as, as collateral. I'd have to go and earn a million dollars in six weeks, or I'd lose everything I'd just put on the yeah, roulette table. How about that? Then, fire up your ass. <laughs> oh, man, I was, I was jacked. I, by the way, it took me just over a week to get the money. But just over a week, no, in terms of the half million. Yeah. So, and I hadn't even seen the place. And within a week of that phone call, I wired over half a million dollars and signed it non-refundable on the strength of getting a million dollars in six weeks from nothing. I'm like, right, time to go to work. And anyway, long story short, I didn't get the million in the six weeks. But I got, a, no, I got at least over half a million, so I added another half million to buy me more time and added it non-refundable. So now they're like, okay, we'll give you another two months. But if they don't pay now, they're a million quid in for nothing. Good deal. So, yeah, win-win. And so, and, and again, everyone knows the, and, and the story. I ended up not only closing on that penthouse, but I'd actually got the money for the penthouse before we were due to close. But it was going to be built inside. It was a shell. And um, part of that money, $1.2 million, was for the internal refresh. I mean, you can imagine the quality. And so I went to Vancouver to, to look at it and spec it up and sit with the developers and the, and the architects and the project managers but I needed somewhere to live in the, in the time it was going to get done. It was going to take 18 months to build it out. So they showed me a $3 million home in West Vancouver, which was the show home for British properties, the, you know, the Guinness family that own basically most of West Vancouver, the Beverly Hills of Vancouver. And it had an elevator in it. It had a pool. I mean, it was just stunning on the mountain, overlooking downtown, a uh, quarter million dollars of furniture. And they said, listen, yeah, you need somewhere to live. We'll give you this property at a 3% mortgage in terms of, a, they'll do a vendor take back, 25% down, vendor take back mortgage with 3% interest, and we'll give you the quarter of a million dollars of the furniture if you take it. And I'm like, well, I could put the deposit down, but it's the money I've got for the penthouse, which it wasn't exciting anymore because I'd already got the money now, right? I wasn't going to lose it. I was about to close in a few weeks. I thought, that gives me a few weeks. Maybe if I take some of the money out of the penthouse and put it in and buy that one, I could get both. So I rolled the dice again. Yeah, just be, and that, that's the kind of stuff I love. You know, if you have any idea how you can achieve the goal you set when you set them, they're too small. And the how is none of your business. You're committed, the house shows up. And I ended up living in that West Vancouver home for a year and a half while they built my penthouse and then moved into the penthouse, sold West Van. And, and yeah, it was, uh, it was one of the most exciting periods of times where I didn't sleep. I was marching up and down the bedroom three in the morning thinking, okay, what can I do? What ideas have I got? What can I come up with? It's like, you know, this, this penthouse is mine. I'm not letting it go. Yeah. I mean, that's probably yeah. the most exciting. Those kind of, uh, it's funny, I was speaking to um, a friend called Andrew Fox, don't know if you had heard of him. He's another, uh, so he's, he's a marketer, fantastic marketer. Um, and we were chatting about his kind of story and his success. And it was a similar thing. He spotted a house that he absolutely wanted. Um, and it was it was out of reach at the time. Like he, he was already, you know, a very well-established entrepreneur, but it was just out of reach at the time. And he he was determined to get it. He put his, his eye on the ball and and uh, he puts that as as having really kind of, slingshotted him into the success that he's, that he's in today. You know, it just kind of gave him that momentum, that huge momentum, which is massive, right? Once you get that and you get moving, then then almost then it's possible. So how would you advise people could find that kind of momentum if they, maybe if they weren't quite ready to put down a multi-million dollar um, <laughs> deposit? I wouldn't buy that. Definitely not. <laughs> so in terms of goals that you could you could set to, to create that kind of momentum, what would you recommend? You, 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 you set yourself up to win, meaning start, in the believability gap. A lot of people put stuff on their vision board that they don't feel connected to it because part of them doesn't believe they can achieve it. They're just hoping some mythical law of attraction is going to sort of bring it to them. They don't know how to work at that level. They don't realize that it meets you halfway from a place of an absolute congruent knowing that it's going to happen, which is what gets you out of bed. So set goals from a, a perspective initially that you, know, you 
you feel that yeah, it's just that little bit of a stretch, but it's meaningful for you. It's not a status symbol. If it's based on ego, it's not going to last because ego is so fragile, it's going to come from fear if it thinks it's not going to get it because it'll trigger the fear you're not enough. So if you set goals that are based upon what you can contribute, what you who you can become, you know, what you can go and, and give as a gift to the world, people can get excited about that far more than like, oh, I want a Ferrari, for example. Yeah, because ultimately the only reason they want the Ferrari most of the time is to try to prove to the world they're good enough for, you know, as a status symbol or you know, some form of, I say, e ego stroke. Doesn't mean say you shouldn't go for a Ferrari, but go for if a Ferrari is going to cost you, you know, two hundred grand. Don't focus on the Ferrari. Focus on okay, how can I add two hundred grand to the value to my customers? Get excited! Oh, by the way, that'll buy me a Ferrari. You see the difference? Yeah. But it's that sense of if you align your heart and your mind together, you have a powerful force. Most people are either just wishy washy with their thoughts and they have no emotional buy in, or their heart is more driven by fear than it is connection to a, a, a purpose. And so questioning you know, what, what gets me up, what lights me up, what gets me up early, keeps me up late, what would I do more for somebody else than I do for myself? What am I really here for? What, and, and if you don't know, just build a bit of momentum. Set a, set a goal to acquire five customers and celebrate the crap out of it. Yeah, then they set your next milestone for 25 customers. Boom. Now you're building a belief train. Soon you're going to be saying, okay, when I hit my next 500 customers, and you've got, you've got references for it. It's like, it's like when I first ran my, my, a marathon, my first marathon in the late 90s, London Marathon, my marathon coach was Stu Mittelman. He was the 1,000-mile world record holder. And when he ran the 1,000 miles, it wasn't a race that was like through scenery. It was on a running track. Can you imagine how boring that 1,000 miles on a standard you know, racetrack at a sports center would be? And he won that. Yeah. I said, what's, I asked him, I messed through several times and spent time with the guy. It was an amazing man. He said, I wasn't running a thousand miles. That's too big. That's too much of a goal. I mean, anyone would say, what's the point? He says, no, no. I was running a mile a thousand times. And when I ran my first marathon, I wasn't trying to run 26 miles. I was trying to run one mile 26 times. Mm. Don't try to get 500 customers if you don't believe that. Go get one customer 500 times. And you'll start building the belief system when all of a sudden you look over your shoulder and think, wow, look how many miles, look how many customers I've got. Mm. It comes back to that momentum, right? It's like you're either spiraling upwards or you're spiraling downwards. And, you know, I know I've been in, in both, um, definitely been in, in both scenarios from, from time to time. That's huge. That's fantastic. Pete, I really enjoy speaking to you, man. Obviously, you know, um, I love your energy. I love your, your backstory, the many things that, you know, you told me that we, we, we've not covered on the, on the podcast as well. Thank you so much for uh, for coming along today. What, is, what are you working on right now? Where can people find out more uh, about uh, and get involved more with your message? Right, well, obviously, petersage.com is kind of the central hub for most of the stuff that I put out there. Uh, obviously, as you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of the book that's out there right now, The Inside Trend, which is helping absolutely everybody, especially in today's time. I mean, the tagline, uh, even though I wrote it three years ago, yeah, the tagline is an inspirational guide to conquering adversity, and you couldn't think of a better time in history right now where most people that would be so relevant for them. And that's, that's just getting reviews. We've just got um, some great uh, testimonials from uh, Brian Tracy, from John Astorak, from John Demartini, um, and, and the list goes on. Tom Campbell, Kevin Trudeau, uh, have all given great testimonials to the book. And so I'm really proud of that. And yeah, just um, love to stay in touch. And I'll have to come back on and share some other stories at some point, some of the stuff we've done together too. And I'm sure everyone on your side would love to hear that. And in the meantime, yeah, anything that they can do to add value, stay in my universe, and it'd be a pleasure to, to yeah, share what I share and hopefully help some people. Absolutely, 100%. I can personally vouch for anyone listening, can personally vouch for Peter's work. has been massively inspirational and, and, and transformational in my own life. Definitely grab yourself a copy of the Inside Track. Fantastic read. And uh, get yourself over to Peter's YouTube channel as well. There it is. Get yourself over to, uh, to Peter's YouTube channel as well. Some fantastic content there, absolutely free. Pete, thank you so much, man. And we'll definitely have you on uh, at some point in the near future to talk about more of the, uh, more the, the wisdom that you've got to share. Look forward to it. Keep doing what you're doing, Dave. You're a genius at what you do. I can bounce for anybody listening to this. If you need a person to be able to take charge of getting your message out there virally and making your ads profitable, this is the man. Yeah, case closed, not even a close second. So, yeah, Dave, thank you. It's been so proud for me to see who you've become in your journey as well, which, uh, as it should be, is never smooth. And, uh, and the way you've risen through that to be the example and the invitation is just heartwarming. So, well done, my friend. It's incredible. Thank you, Pete. Appreciate that one. 
This has been the Viral by Design podcast with Dave Rothero. For more viral marketing secrets and to get detailed cliff notes on all episodes, visit viralbydesign.net. 